So now I'd like to invite my colleague, Lindsay Maychak to the stage to introduce our fireside chat. Over to you, Lindsay. Awesome, thanks, Jack. I remembered to unmute myself, which in this day and age is an accomplishment. So uh, <laughs> already taken a, a win here now, but I'm very excited uh, to introduce our next speaker. Uh, we're going to talk a little bit more about how transition broker teams were formed and why they're happening now. So the guest today is Dr. Matt Willis. He's the director of Army Prize Competitions and the Army Applied Cyber Program. His role focuses on instilling portfolio management strategies, synchronizing the execution of Army Applied Cyber Program and the prize authority to meet congressional economic intent and fill those Army technology capability gaps. So Dr. Willis has spearheaded this initiative in the Army and in introducing transition broker teams as this new method. So we're gonna talk to, talk to him about the conception of the program and what his vision is into the future. So Dr. Willis, welcome to the stage, excited for this one-on-one -on -one opportunity. Did I miss anything in your introduction that the people need to know about? <laughs> That's a lot of pressure. No, no, I think that was a, it was a great introduction. All right, fantastic. So just as an overview for those of you that haven't met Dr. Willis before, can you give us, Matt, just a quick uh, overview as to what your day-to-day -day looks like? Sure. So, um, so yeah, for, for context, I, I work at headquarters, Department of the Army specifically in the office of the Assistant Secretary of the Army for Acquisition Logistics and Technology. So in general, um, uh, our, our boss, who's the, the Honorable uh, Mr. Doug Bush, has oversight for all of the Army's uh, research, development, engineering, and uh, acquisition processes uh, within the Army. So specifically within that organization, I manage the Army is, uh, or the, the ASALT portion of the SBIR program, and also our uh, prize competition portfolio, which includes the XTech uh, prize competition. Great. And so I know you've had this vast experience leading up to this moment. So what were some of the challenges that you're trying to solve with the introduction of the transition broker teams? Yeah, so... Uh, the establishment of the transition broker teams was precipitated by, I'd say, many different uh, events, uh, and also, you know, uh, you know, as was discussed in some of the panels earlier, a desire to be more deliberate about really facilitating a transition across the, you know, uh, the quote-unquote valley of death. So the Army, the DoD, uh, you know, the government writ large has really been working. Uh, steadfastly about, again, how we can uh, optimize our investments through programs uh, such as the SBIR program, the STTR program, the Technology Maturation Initiative, which is another Army program executed out of ASALT. Um, again, to really take technologies out of the lab or out of the uh, you know, science and technology realm and mature them to a point so that they can have impact on uh, programs of record and uh, technologies that are being deployed uh, to the warfighter. So again, um, the, the establishment of these entities was really precipitated by, of course, trying to do that, but it's been something that's been ongoing for you know, decades, to be honest. Um, in addition to, uh, you know, the new administration came in uh, about a year ago and uh, under the direction of the Deputy Secretary of Defense, which is Ms. Uh, Kathleen uh, Hicks, uh, the OSD established this Innovation Steering Group. And the Innovation Steering Group is across the Department of Defense. It's really looking at ways that, again, the DOD can be more explicit and deliberate about how we engage with the innovation ecosystem, with small businesses, uh, with startups about how we can, uh, again, inject innovation into DOD systems. Um, and one of the primary focuses that uh, they identified was transition. So uh, under the auspices of the Army and the ASALT program, uh, that was really the sort of inception point of these transition broker teams, which is, again, how we can um, work up front to develop uh, you know, a deliberate transition strategy and transition pathway for SBIR programs. Because historically, uh, you know, it's been a lot of tech push and not a lot of you know, tech pull. Um, not the tech pull is always the answer, but you know, at least 
you know, having a goal and a transition opportunity in mind is, is I think what the, uh, what the objective is here. Yeah, and I want to, you know, keep you keep going back to that word deliberate, right? All of the things that, that you're implementing are very deliberate steps, but taking it full picture up at the top, why does the Army want to work with small businesses, whether it's via X-Tech uh, and that, those prize competitions or via the CIBR? Why does the Army find value in small businesses with these innovative technologies? Well, <laughs> I mean... Uh... The, the Army, the DOD, you know, we certainly recognize that small businesses, startups, you know, you are at the, the, the tip of, of innovation, of, of really um, pushing technology forward. And not that, of course, the, uh, the, 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 the big defense primes are not being innovative in terms of the technologies that they're developing. But, you know, frankly, you know, in terms of pushing technology forward and making those leap ahead, right? We're not looking in, within the SBIR program for, let's say, uh, evolutionary advancements in technology. We're looking for what are, what are those game-changing uh, innovations that are really going to um, move our technology forward and, you know, by an order of magnitude, by two orders of magnitude. How can we provide these new capabilities to our soldiers uh, so that they are, uh, as equipped and capable and able as they possibly can be uh, in any future potential conflicts. And so when you're putting together the idea and the construct of transition broker teams, and as you're leading the applied cyber program, what kind of things did you hear from army stakeholders and from the small businesses that helped led to the construct of these teams? Yeah, that, uh, that's a, a, a good question. So, um, so yeah, I think from a lot of our you know stakeholder community with within the army, uh, the concern and the challenge that a lot of our program executive offices had is again that they felt like um, many of the uh, prior uh, SBIR efforts were, I'd say, siloed. So they were um, you know managed by a handful of individuals. Uh, who would, you know, help the small business execute a project or execute a, a technology in support of an army need, but there wasn't really much coherence or integration, you know, across uh, the enterprise. So uh, when the technology or when the project would end, uh, there wasn't someone, you know, I'll go back to, well, I like to use stupid, well, not stupid, I like to use metaphors. And so I, I picked up on, uh, on Marcus and Blaze's, you know, metaphor about, you know, the, the pitcher and the catcher, right? So now we have a mechanism using the transition broker teams where the uh, the transition partner is not only waiting for it, the technology, but they're cognizant of what the technology's capabilities are. Um, they are cognizant of when it's going to uh, be ready for transition. And they also have the opportunity to program funds so that we can facilitate those phase three activities. So again, um, it was about having visibility in terms of the you know, spectrum of different activities that are going on. I mean, the Army at any given time has, I'd say, three to 500 small business innovation research projects going on concurrently. That's a lot, right? And so we're just trying to, to you know, get our arms around all these different activities that are ongoing. So again, we can posture firms and companies to be able to transition their technologies. So how specifically will the transition broker teams help meld that across all of these hundreds of things that are happening across the program? Um, I think the, the how is a simple question, but one that I, I know everybody in the audience is, is asking for, you know, what does that look like in practice to you? I'm not, I'm not certain it's a simple answer, but uh, <laughs> yeah, the, the question itself, how is a three simple word, but certainly uh, not an answer that's fair. <laughs> Yeah, so, you know, I think that to, to try to encapsulate it in, in, a, in a nutshell, right, it is that um, we are shaping our uh, SBIR efforts and uh, prioritizing our resources um, with the end in mind, right? So, uh, you know, under the auspices of the SBIR program, there's a tremendous amount of flexibility. Um, 
So, you know, historically, m many uh, organizations have, you know, okay, this is what a, a phase one sipper is. It's X dollars and it lasts X number of months. Or here's a phase two, it's um, Y dollars and that, you know, lasts whatever, how, however long. Um, but using that methodology really, you know, puts us in a very static, uh, you know, operational modality where, again, there's a standard endpoint. And whether that endpoint aligns with the transition opportunity or not, you know, it ends what it ends. But so what the transition broker team allows, right, is to bring those stakeholders in up front. So bring the transition partners in up front, identify, you know, from a true cost schedule performance perspective. And I know I work for the government. I hate sounding like a bureaucrat or, but, you know, the acquisition uh, system within the army is driven by cost schedule and performance. So performance, what technology do we need to deliver? cost when is or sorry cost how much should it cost and then uh you know schedule where is that transition opportunity how long should it take so we're really building that in up front and saying assuming this project is successful assuming this technology goes through a phase one and a phase two and you know maybe a sequential phase two phase two enhancement whatever um where is that transition opportunity so we're having our customers come in and say here's the transition opportunity um, here's the milestone we're looking for. This is what our objectives are from a technical perspective. And here's how much we believe it should cost. Um, and we're using that to shape what the acquisition profile looks like, vice having this standard static process. So, so I think what, uh, what the, the audience will experience um, is a number of things. So, so uh, you know, one thing that, that Blaze mentioned, you know, we're releasing topics throughout the year. So yes, it's helped spread the, the workload out throughout the year, but you know, really it, it speaks to the fact that um, you know, we're responding to army needs. So we're being agile and responsive. So if there is, let's say an emerging army need, we can um, execute a topic quickly, um, but also you know, the um, spacing out of the topics throughout the year is really a um, representative of the fact that you know, we are tying these periods of performance directly to a transition opportunity. So um, it isn't just, you know, random or, or by happenstance that we're uh, spreading them out. I think you'll also see that um, we're really trying to flex in terms of the uh, resourcing uh, limits. So, you know, for instance, if there is a particular rationale or reason why uh, the Army believes an effort might take more than what a standard uh, phase two limit is, then, you know, we are really trying to be flexible there. Or if we want to have a very quick phase one, uh, you know, a couple months uh, with a, a lower threshold, you know, it's, you know, we're really, again, trying to flex the system in a way that, again, uh, helps the Army identify all these innovation, innovative technologies that are out there. and and really posture them to be successful in terms of transitioning. So from a flexibility perspective, right? Companies come in with SIP rewards. What does that flexibility look like within, uh, within the program itself, right? And within the construct of transition broker teams, what, can you deep dive a little bit more into flexibility and what that means for, for those that are applying and, and have been awarded? I guess, well, I, I don't know, could, could you clarify? Yeah, yeah. So a uh, company comes in that have gone through the SIBR, uh, has won a SIBR before in the past, right? And now they're coming through to a uh, new SIBR that's been aligned with the transition broker teams. Um, and I and I like the term flexibility that you're were, you were highlighting there. So I'm curious for somebody that's been through it before, going through it again, what are some of the differences they're going to see? And what does that term flexibility uh, mean? Sure. Okay. Yeah. So so that that's a great point. So with the fact that we are... Um, you know, releasing topics on a rolling basis uh, throughout the year. Um, we still go through the standard process that all DOD organizations have to go through the uh, OSD's uh, DSIP portal. Um, so all of our solicitations will still be released there. We'll, of course, advertise them on uh, the Army Cyber uh, social media uh, and also on our, our website, armycyber.army.mil. But I would take care. <laughs> To, to look at the, I'd say the, the requirements. So, so within each solicitation that we'll have, you know, here's what we anticipate to be accomplished during the phase one of, of the 
project or phase two of the project, or if it's a direct to phase two, uh, take note of that. Also within all the solicitations, it will provide the anticipated period, period of performance and also the, uh, the limit on the, the funding, uh, so the ceiling. So, um, you know, I would encourage all the firms to, of course, pay attention to those, those details. Uh, the other difference um, that will be uh, notable to, to the firms, particularly if you haven't applied to any of the solicitations within the last year or so, is that we have drastically changed the proposal requirements um, to a point where, you know, phase one proposals were limiting to, to five pages. And th there, there's a rationale on both sides of the house here. I mean, we recognize that as a small business, um, writing proposals takes time, right? Um, and writing a 50 page proposal for a, you know, phase one award of what well, previously was $110,000 just seemed a, a, like the, the value proposition wasn't there. So, so again, we're really trying to streamline proposal requirements to make it easier for you to uh, submit proposals uh, for the program. Um, I'll also say that, you know, for certain, uh, topics or certain projects that we're pursuing, we might have, you know, so, so Marcus talked about the, the X tech cyber. So for that particular set of, of projects, we did a pitch process. Uh, so if you've applied to the air force, they sometimes do pitch, uh, you know, a pitch proposal for, um, the evaluation. So, so again, I, I pay attention to, you know, the period of performance, the funding limitations, and also the proposal requirements to make sure that, uh, that you're tracking all those. Yeah, I, I heard a collective like kind of sigh when you said the the page length of the proposals from the other side of the virtual ether of like that, oh, not 50 pages. That feels good. That sounds a lot, a lot better. But just a reminder to everybody out there, the QA is open. So if you have a question for Dr. Willis or you see another question that you want to be answered, use that upvote feature to bring that to the top of the queue. So that QA is open and I'm monitoring monitoring it uh, to bring your questions live. Like my next question here, this comes from Farah, uh, and they would like to know, how is transition broker effectiveness measured? So what are you looking for in terms of metrics, and how are you going to determine if the transition broker teams are successful over time? That's a fabulous question. And so I think, and it's tough to answer, of course. So, uh, you know, measuring transition is, is definitely challenging. And there isn't one, you know, say... Uh, metric or modality that you know we can specifically tie to whether or not a project uh, had a quote unquote successful transition. Of course there are some easy ones, right? So um, if a project reaches, you know, let's say phase three. So just to make sure everyone's tracking. So phase three is um, a follow-on contract uh, following either a phase one or phase two SBIR award that's funded by non cibber dollars. So I'd say, I, I actually will we'll take a step back. Um, and obviously all of you are dialing into, uh, you know, this as, as, as an army event, but, um, you know, in case you're familiar or more familiar with other government agencies outside of the DOD in terms of the SBIR program, one of the things that makes the DOD unique um, within the SBIR program and the STTR program is that we're both uh, technology investors and also technology consumers, right? So uh, we invest in areas that are relevant to the Army, uh, but we also, of course, then through the uh, research development and acquisition enterprise are acquiring technologies to deploy uh, out to uh, the soldiers. So a phase three, quote unquote phase three, is I, I think certainly an easy metric for whether or not um, the transition broker teams were able to, well, broker a transition to a, a partner within uh, or a stakeholder, you know, within the transition broker team uh, to, to get to that phase three award. Um, you know, we are looking at some other uh, metrics of effectiveness, metrics of performance, you know, um, absolutely, we need to help hold ourselves accountable. You know, one of the challenges with the cyber program is that a lot of the uh, the ability to, to, to measure effectiveness can take time. And so, um, again, the, the TBTs were stood up the first two uh, last summer. And 
hopefully we will begin to see some, some impacts here very shortly. I'd say that, you know, one of the success stories that we've already seen, actually, uh, which I think was facilitated uniquely by the transition broker team con concept is that we actually identified a, a project uh, that had multiple potential applications across many different PEO customers, right? So, so why is this unique? So rather than the army duplicating potential uh, resources in multiple different PEOs, with these PEOs not even cognizant of these other work streams that were ongoing, we were able to identify a capability with multiple potential customers um, that we can pursue through the SBIR program, which again then has multiple different avenues for transition. So this helps the army in that we're not duplicating resources. So we're, we're, we're saving army resources. And from your perspective as a small business, uh, you have multiple potential customers uh, on the back end. Yeah, I, again, everybody at home is like multiple potential customers on the back end, short proposals, uh, good things that we're highlighting today. Uh, so going back to the beginning of when Transition Broker Team started and, and you're you know, working with your team and within the Army to formulate this idea, I know that you're very deliberate in everything that you do since I've known you, right? And, and I'm sure your whole career before that, but why Transition Broker Teams is the name? Why is that term broker something that you felt was important to include in the naming of this new convention? Yeah, so... <sighs> You're right. the 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 name was was deliberate, uh, and that I would say that. So oftentimes, uh, so transition is hard, right? We we all recognize this, right? The the valley of death is well, it's it's called that for a reason. You know, it's it's really really difficult to get technologies again from you know a technology readiness level of let's say four or five, so late stage science and technology um, into um, a, a maturity level where the PEOs or PMs or product managers are willing to take risk to adopt it into their program. And a lot of that depends on relationships. And we recognize, of course, you know, relationships are not necessarily scalable, but um, that was sort of the, the intention here with, with the team, right? So this transition broker team is a multidisciplinary team of experts. Um, and I will go into the actual components, I think in some of the, the later sessions, but there's uh, you know, a technical uh, expertise uh, involved. There's an acquisition arm, and there's also a, a business analyst or you know, marketing uh, or market readiness uh, perspective. And so these teams of um, you know, different components that are relevant to the success of, of a technology or to the Army SBIR program work together, broker relationships to facilitate transition. I said that was, I guess, the, the genesis of the, the name. Yeah, that's a, that's a good teaser. So coming up after our fireside chat with Dr. Willis, we'll actually be breaking down each of the individual components of the TBT, and you'll get to talk to representatives from each of those components and ask your questions to them directly. So that's coming up next. Thank you uh, for the teaser there, Matt, uh, coming up, right? Uh, just throw that bug in the middle of uh, the program here. But speaking of those individual components and as they're getting constructed together, why was it important to have one technology, one acquisition and business, why is it important to have each of those components in this transition broker team versus just one siloed um, by itself? Well, I think you used the word in the, in the question, right? Is that, uh, <laughs> so within the army, you know, we have all these, um, you know, as, as Blaze likes to put it, uh, steel stovepipes of excellence. So we have all of these, you know, great centers of excellence, be it within, uh, the Army laboratories or our science and technology ecosystem, or be it within uh, our PEOs, PMs, product managers that are developing and delivering and deploying um, systems for, for the, the warfighter. And then we also have uh, you know, technologists uh, that are looking at the market space, identifying opportunity uh, for the Army uh, to, uh, to be able to innovate. But there hasn't been a lot of that, that uh, connective tissue or that, that cross, cross set, that cross leveling. So 
um, you know, the intention and the rationale for bringing all of these components together was really to provide that connective tissue so that we can, you know, build an in infrastructure to best facilitate those transitions to happen. And then how, and it, and it, um, oh, sorry, go ahead. No, go for it, go for it. I was just gonna say how, you know, for those that have been working across the, either the cyber ecosystem as a whole, the innovation ecosystem, entrepreneurs, right? Um, how unique is this within that ecosystem or even uniqueness within the DOD, just for some context here? Like, is this something people are gonna see elsewhere? Is this a, you know, entirely new concept? Just how unique is it? Well, I think it's pretty unique, but no, <laughs> no, I, I think it's 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 very unique. I mean, I think there's there's certainly um, you know there's there's a recognition within the DoD, you know, that we need to do things differently, right? So e even within so within my parent organization within within ASALT, um, you know, the Army Acquisition Executive is dedicated to streamlining acquisition, government acquisition. It takes a long time. That's just just recognized. So, but you know, this is is a mechanism and a goal to to try to again break down some of those barriers. So so actually, you know, it's an interesting um, point that a lot of this, and even going back, but before we established this transition broker team methodology, a lot of the um, organizational construct and some of the practices that we have. Uh, developed and employed uh, were actually started during uh, the the X Tech Prize Competition, which again, so this is a uh, well, it started as an open topic prize competition. It was launched in 2018, um, and the goal, uh, and the goal still remains, right, was to really break down barriers between the Army and small businesses, startups, etc. So we utilized a, a number of different uh, methodologies to do this, uh, but one of the things that really did, you know, provide tremendous tremendous amount of value to both the army and small businesses was having the right people in the room and having a diverse number of perspectives in the room when we're looking at these different technologies. So where we'd have the, uh, you know, the deep technical subject matter experts, we have the uh, acquisition professionals. Um, that could say, is there, you know, a potential application or pot potential opportunity for transition? And then we also have the um, members of the Army community, for instance, from the 75th Innovation Command, who are, are reservists, so they spend part-time in the private sector and part-time, uh, you know, within, you know, serving, at, serving on the Army or with the Army uh, to really, again, provide that, you um, assessment of the market readiness and, you know, whether or not the technology, A, has, again, potential to the Army, but do they have that commercialization potential as well? So, you know, a lot of the best practices we learned and we evolved through the XTech program have been adopted here within this, this construct. Right, learning and adding them in, that's that's great. And I, and I want to now shift back to our audience questions because we have quite a few coming in. And again, that Q&A feature at the bottom of your screen is where you can submit your questions. We just have about 10, 15 minutes or so with Dr. Willis yet. So get those questions in before we deep dive into the individual components of the TBTs. Uh, so this question comes from Harry uh, and he'd like to know any news on the new contracting center of excellence for companies who are, uh, looking to, to be contracted and any info on timeline, any updates on, on the contracting center for excellence? Yes, no, so absolutely. So, um, and I think we had mentioned it earlier, but again, you know, part of this sort of um, reassessment uh, and reconfiguration of the Army program was trying to figure out, uh, well, A, how we could do better at transition, of course, uh, but B, again, how can we make it easier for small businesses to engage with the program and also for our army customers. So our, our PMs, our product managers to, to engage with the program. And a lot of the feedback we received early on, honestly, was that from an army uh, perspective, the value proposition wasn't there. So, you know, there was a tremendous amount of administrative burden for, for PMs to participate. Um, so traditionally within the Army, all of the contracts were executed individually by 
uh, by different offices. So, you know, for instance, for, for those in, in the audience, uh, if you've had more than one SBIR projects with the project with the Army, you probably had more than one uh, acquisition officer or contract officer that was uh, that was managing uh, that award, and more than likely the contract was different, um, and you know it, it there was a little consistency from from organization to organization. So, so we heard all that, and um, we you know made the decision to. Uh, establish this this contracting center of excellence and and yes I know I've been talking if, if you've if you've tuned in to any of the uh, my previous public things I've been talking about this for a while but I am happy to say that uh, the the contracting COE has been stood up it's been staffed within the army which is no small feat uh, especially within HQDA um, and uh, they are operational as of this month so moving out any contracts that are being executed through the uh, the ASOL portion of the SBIR program will be executed by the contracting uh, center of excellence. And so we really believe, you know, this is going to streamline activities tremendously. So, well, A, there'll be consistency uh, for, for all of you uh, small businesses that are engaging into the office. You know, B, we're streamlining all of the requirements. Um, and C, you know, I, I think, and this is one thing that makes us very unique, I think, uh, within the DOD, uh, is that you know this uh, center of excellence was not established at Army Contracting Command. Not that there's anything wrong with Army Contracting Command, but it, it was established in ASALT. Um, and I think that uh, you know this this might sound you know hokey to to all the people that are not in the government, but you know. Congress has provided a tremendous amount of flexibilities in terms of how the government, how the DOD can uh, execute our contracts. With especially with SBIR awards, there's an emphasis even in the law that the DOD needs to do better about making these awards happen quicker. And so, uh, part of the rationale, uh, you know, that I you know fought for for putting this cell within ASAL was so that we could leverage all of these flexibilities that are delegated to the Army Acquisition Executive, um, the ASALT, um, to, again, really streamline execution of these awards. Because, you know, we recognize that, you know, in the past it's taken, you know, sometimes six, eight, 12 months uh, to execute an award. And that's just, uh, that's not tenable for you as a small business and it doesn't benefit the Army. You know, we are looking to, again, we're not just investing in, technology development. We're investing in technology development so then we can acquire the technology. And so any delay in the contract is just going to delay our ability to acquire the technology and transition where it needs to go. Yeah, absolutely. Thank you for that question, Harry. Again, just a few minutes left. So please put your questions in the chat if you have them. Another audience question for you, Matt. How would you address companies with platforms that have R&D crossing multiple transition broker team disciplines? So autonomy and clean tech, for example. Yeah, that, so, you know, I think that, um, again, since the, the establishment of these organizations is relatively new, um, for the most part, you'll, you'll find topics or projects that are specifically aligned to, to one transition broker team or the other, at least within the next, I'd say six, six months or so. But we're starting to, to find a, a lot of overlap. And again, we're, we're not looking to establish more stovepipes, right? I uh, said so that we establish a transition broker team to break down stovepipes. We aren't gonna just have five new stovepipes, you know, based on what the, uh, the transition broker team topic areas are. So, you know, the, the there is an interest to you know, look at potential overlap opportunities because absolutely, um, we have identified these five priority areas, um, recognizing that they are still quite broad and there is a lot of overlap, uh, you know, between them. So, um, yeah, I think that answers the question. Yeah, I think so too. Thank you for, for submitting that question. So another question from the audience, uh, this comes from Nick. Uh, does the Army look for instances where there may be increased value added by matching two different companies? So for the ones that competed for the phase two effort to team up for a phase two follow-on program, is that something that's ever been considered or, or uh, considered? Yes, that's my question. And that's the question from Nick. 
Yes, absolutely. So um, uh, one example I, I will give is, so the, the Army Applications Laboratory um, runs a program uh, through SBIR, it's called the Spartan Program, where they actually have a, a cohort model where they you know, have a, uh, a problem set and a number of companies uh, work on this uh, specific problem set. And uh, as they move along in the competition, there are you know, potential opportunities for, uh, for them to team up for, uh, for future awards. So that's absolutely something that, that's possible. We, we, don't, we have not done that yet uh, directly within the ASOL program, but, uh, but absolutely. And I will say we've also seen um, examples of that through the XTEC competition as well. So we absolutely would, would encourage that. You know, we're looking for the best, the best of breed technologies here. Great. Uh, and, and a similar question here to take it to a high level for those that are new and unfamiliar. Uh, so Rachel is still learning about SIBRS uh, and she'd like to know, is the TBT a standalone program or is this something that when you apply for a SIBR, you're matched with the staff from the transition broker team or do you apply for acceptance in the transition broker team? What's, what's the relationship between SIBRS and transition broker teams? I think that high level question for context would be helpful for her and, and perhaps other people in the audience as well. Yeah, so okay, that's that's a great question. And so for, for you as a small business, it really should be transparent for you. All right. So, you know, the transition broker team is really a mechanism that we're setting up within the Army to help us manage and modulate the projects that are being pursued under the SBIR program. So, so, you know, in terms of, uh, you know, small business applying to a solicitation that's out there, most of the solicitations will be done under this transition broker team construct, but um, your, you know, experience and, and engagement should be, you know, relatively transparent. What, what it does mean to you, though, um, is, well, A, when you are uh, actually executing your project, rather than just having a single point of contact uh, within the army, there will most likely be multiple different stakeholders in the room. Uh, so we'll have some transition partners in the room, the virtual room, most of these happen virtually, but uh, uh, transition partners, you'll have perhaps some, some technical experts um, you know, during the, the progress reviews. And also, uh, you know, for all the topics that are released under the transition broker team, again, before we release these projects or these topic areas, we ensure that our customer, so our, our PEO PM, has a transition plan. So there's a plan for transitioning these technologies. So, so you can be rest assured that, again, if your technology is successful and you meet your mission, and, and again, we get this, this is R&D, you know, R&D is not always successful, right? Um, but if successful, you know, there is an, an intention by the Army to actually adopt these technologies. So, um, so yeah. Yeah, intention at the end, and that's why they're brought up in earlier into the, the process, uh, makes complete picture there uh, with a bow on it. So this question comes from Stephen. It's pretty broad, but I'd uh, like to know, is there any change in the approach to the commercialization aspects? Yeah, so commercialization is absolutely important, and actually, it's it's a it's a key component of the proposal uh, when when you're uh, sub submitting uh, for both phase one or, or phase two is the commercialization potential for your technology, and 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 I'll tell you why. So you know these transition broker teams again the um, the the rationale for. Um, the topic areas. I don't believe we've talked about that, uh, or the technology verticals, I should say. Um, so I'll go into that briefly. So how were these five areas identified? Um, so you know, first off, of course, there, you know, these are areas that are applicable to the army, uh, but equally, uh, you know, important, uh, they are technology domains where the private sector, you, um, have capabilities that outpace the government. So, you know, really the, the objective and the desire from Army senior leaders was to say, okay, uh, with the SBIR dollars, how can we best invest these dollars to maximize the return for the Army, to synergize with 
private sector excellence and private sector um, investments that are already happening in these domains. So, so A, is, is there an application for the Army? You know, B, is there, um, you know, excellence, technology excellence, innovation happening in the private sector? And C, is there market growth potential? So are these technology domains where regardless of if the government is investing there, um, are there already going to be a, you know, confluence of innovative small businesses, uh, you know, investing in, in these domains? So, um, so in that, in that regard, obviously, you know, there, there should be a, a strong commercialization potential for these technologies because we're really investing in, you know, dual use technologies, things that certainly if they're going to be deployed or integrated in army systems will require, you know, some additional, you know, research and development. But again, we're really trying to synergize the army cyber dollars, uh, you know, with uh, private sector uh, investments in these domains. Right. Commercialization, dual use, uh, a theme that you see throughout the not only X Tech prize competitions, but also uh, the applied cyber program here at the Army. So, uh, just a few minutes left here. Another question How is the diversity considered as part of a value proposition? So, geographical diversity, for example, is a startup in the Bay Area more likely to secure funds because of the talents that exist in the remotes? But, but does diversity in terms of geography affect any awards at all? So I'll say that, that uh, you know, the Army has, you know, investments in, I believe, 49 states uh, and Puerto Rico. So, um, you know, all across the country. Of course, to be eligible for an SBIR uh, project, you need to A, be a small business under 500 employees, uh, B, you know, be, uh, you know, 50 one percent owned by um, individuals in the U.S. So um, the you know specific demographics, uh, you know, location-wise, or you know, if uh, you know you are a women-owned small business or a veteran-owned small business or um, in a hub zone, um, is immaterial to the actual uh, you know evaluation of the technology proposal. That being said, you know, we are investing a, a lot in trying to inc in increase the, the diversity of, of small businesses that apply to the program and that, that, that are awarded. Um, so, and that is a priority of Congress. And, um, you know, I'd say that, uh, you know, we're, we're continuing to try to, to, to evolve again, to, to increase the, the percentage of applications from these, you know, subsets of small businesses. Great. All right. Two questions remain, one of them from the audience and one selfishly that I'm going to ask. Uh, so first from the audience, uh, they've already, James has already achieved several cyber phase twos and qualifying directly for phase two. So how does he transition across the army applied cyber to move forward into the next phases? So I guess from phase two to into the phase three. Yeah, so a, a lot of that, of course, depends on the, the ma maturity of the technology, uh, the identify, identification of your, your transition partner, um, you know, potential application, you know, within different program executive offices or, or PMs. And, and our office can, can certainly help with, with that, right? I mean, so um, if, if it hasn't, if I didn't say it before, which I don't think I have, but, it, you know, we're here to help. We want to see you be successful. Right, um, you know, ultimately we're investing cyber dollars to again identify uh, leap ahead technologies to deploy them into army systems, and we're not going to be able to do that a if uh, you know the research isn't successful, or if you, if you're not successful, and b if you don't find the right transition partner, or you know if you're not successful as a small business ex outside of the SBI or program. So we've established a lot of resources. Um, so under the CIBR program, we've also started a, an accelerator um, that again, really helps with a lot of that customer discovery pieces. Uh, we also offer uh, TABA, which is technical and business assistance. Um, again, all these resources are invested into ensuring that you as a small business continue to be successful either you know with the army as a customer or, or with another uh, organization 
I think you read my mind a little bit there because I was going to ask you about some of the other resources the Army provided for um, small businesses, but is there anything else as we wrap up that you want folks in the audience to know or take away from the conversation today? Yeah, I would certainly say, you know, follow, you know, follow us on social media. We try to be as uh, you know transparent as possible about opportunities either within the Army or external to the Army. Um, you know, our, our website is, is pretty comprehensive. Um, and again, we, we are constantly evolving uh, and, and offering new opportunities such as, like I said, the, the accelerator, um, the TABA program. We're looking at other potential pilot programs, again, really aimed at leaning forward and trying to focus on transition uh, and provide opportunities for, for small business partners to, to be successful and to cr contribute to our mission. Yes. Well, thank you so much, Dr. Matt Willis, everyone. Appreciate you taking the time to deep dive into transition broker teams. So thank you for joining us. And at this time, I'm going to hand it back over to my colleague, Jack Ryan, who's going to deep dive into those component elements, those three legs of the stool of the transition broker team. So Jack, handing it back over to you. And thanks again to Dr. Willis.